Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, hope you got some time to do a few things and um, look at some of our sponsors' uh, information. Um, at this point, we're I'm very uh, pleased to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Joe Parks as our next speaker. And um, I think the information he's going to be providing will be really uh, timely and informative. Um, so l let me, uh, Joe, I'm going to introduce you formally and then a little less formally too. Okay. Um, the, the, the formal part is Joe is the uh, Vice President, Practice Improvement and Medical Director for the National Council for Behavioral Health. Joe, it says here you have had nearly two decades of experience with public health, but I think that's more like three or four decades now, I, th I think. But anyway, very experienced. He was na he's uh, named director of the Missouri Health Net Division of uh, the Missouri Department of Social Services in 2013. That's the Medicaid agency there in Missouri. He was also medical director for the Missouri Department of Mental Health and also division director for uh, Division of Comprehensive Psychiatric Services for the state of Missouri as well. Uh, Dr. Parks also holds the position of distinguished research professor Professor of Science at the University of Missouri St. Louis and is a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of Missouri Department of Psychiatry in Columbia. He practices psychiatry on an outpatient basis at uh, the Family Health Center, a federally, a federally funded community health center established to expand services to the uninsured and underinsured patients in central Missouri. Dr. Parks has made outstanding contributions to community mental health and to the uh, work of the National Council for Behavioral Health. Um, and uh, one, one thing I wanted to do, do Joe, is uh, as president of the society, um, I have the uh, opportunity to make presidential awards. So um, what I'd like to do is, is make one for you and all your years of service to uh, this country, Missouri, and all the, all the wonderful things you've done. And uh, let me just read what it says. It says, presented, Arizona Psychiatric Society presents to Joe Parks its Presidential Award for Leadership in recognition of outstanding leadership contributions in the practice of psychiatry that best exemplify the society's mission of promoting the welfare of those with mental illness and fostering principles of psychiatry. So uh, this is what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll send it out to you, try to get the glare off of there. Uh, okay. But it's, it's really a nice, nice uh, plaque and uh, well-deserved too. The informal part of this is first off, I want to thank you very much for, for doing this. Um, really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And, um, you know, we met, as you may recall, in Missouri many years ago when you were at the state. And I believe Keith Schaefer was your boss. Yep. And, and uh Keith was an interesting guy, a great guy, actually, who used to fly around Missouri in a single engine plane <laughs> all the time. And uh, he always asked me to go for a ride, but I never did. I was yeah. <laughs> I see another engine on that plane. <laughs> uh, but we did. And, and I think the, one of the things that, that uh, I've always really uh, uh, respect and appreciated about Joe is just his focus on, on people, on patients. A lot of reasons for him, for him doing that. But uh, one of the things, I'm, I'm not sure everyone knows, but while you've been involved and dealt with managed care, you've not exactly been a managed care friend over the years. I mean, in terms of someone who thinks it's a good idea. And, uh, and actually, that was one of the things we shared. While I've helped grow a couple of managed care companies, I always believed in provider-based managed care, where it was a collaboration. That's actually what led us and Value Options out to Missouri did, was to create a partnership with the Association of uh, State Community Mental Health Centers way back in the uh, mid 90s. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we were not able to do there what we did in uh, Florida and Colorado, but the, the spirit was there, the concept was there. We met a lot of good people, including you. And, um, you know, we always, you know, felt very, very positive. I know VO went on to do some work there eventually. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is I think this is a timely talk that, that you're going to be giving. Um, on a related note, our, um, we've been involved with parity here in the state for the last few years and had the good fortune of having a bill passed in February called Jake's Law, which basically requires insurers to report their compliance with the law. And there's a lot more to it than just that. But I think, um, you know, what you're going to have to talk to us about is, is 
at least related to that and I think can even help inform it some. So without uh, any further ado, let me turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Don. And uh, I, I wanna thank both you personally and the society for, uh, for honoring me with, with, this, uh, with this award. You know, I think the, I'm deeply touched. Uh, you know, we all work hard in our profession and I think the greatest reward is being acknowledged by the other people who really know what the work is. And, and have been there in the trenches with us. And I, I really uh, appreciate our long partnership going back to what you mentioned in, in the uh, early 90s in Missouri. And that really, uh, that work with value options and you and Keith started us down a path that uh, led, led to integrated care systems and care coordination and health homes. And it helped us become data driven and it, it saved a lot of lives and we couldn't have done it uh, without your input and without Keith's support. You know, uh, I have been tough on managed care companies, um, and I, I think that uh, they are there's good people in them that are hardworking and they do some good, uh, but there there are unfortunate incentives built into them that make it hard for them to do as good as they could, and because of that, they need our active involvement both as providers or as the payers and the people who purchase healthcare from them. You know. One thing I have to acknowledge, uh, when I was in state government, one of the, some of the best things that ever happened to me were getting sued because there were parts of my constraints that had me doing things I didn't want to do. So uh, this is some information I want to give the society today on how they can actively help manage care be better. And I guarantee many of you will, many of the people, the good people that work in managed care will welcome the pressure. They need outside pressure uh, to do as good as they wish they could do, uh, just as I at times in my state role needed outside pressure uh, to, to work through the constraints and you, you can't all do it yourself. Uh, I'm also honored to follow my good friend, uh, Dr. Sater. I've been following Lloyd around for years and it, it's always awesome to listen to him. So I'm gonna talk about uh, something that's not quite the same as parody, but related and give you some new strategies to improve access and to improve uh, payment that come out of a recent court case. And for some reason, my, here we go, advanced slides, that's right. There we go. So we're gonna go over some systemic factors that influence care denials. And you should be provided separately as part of this meeting uh, with a toolkit that we worked up at the National Council for Behavioral Health uh, to help organizations and clinicians like yourself make use of the new legal ground that's been plowed in the case I'm gonna walk you through. And if you learn how to use this toolkit and apply it, I think you'll be much more successful and effective in appealing care denials, which over time will modify the behavior of the managed care companies. I'm gonna include at the end a case study from one of our other members uh, who incorporated it and explained some of how they did it in their organization. And then hopefully we'll have some time left for discussion. Uh, I also wanna thank you. Uh, many of you are members of the National Council, whether you know it or not, we have about 3,300 members and we have a number of members in Arizona. So uh, thank you for that. So to set the stage, you know, there's a disconnect between how treating clinicians assess the care needed and how insurance utilization review clinicians assess the care needed. So clinicians focus on recovery, a treatment goal that's within these generally accepted standards of care. And this case was really about the utilization review clinician over-focusing on crisis stabilization, which is only one part of the standard of care and focusing on crisis stabilization to the exclusion of the other things necessary for recovery is outside of that general accepted standard of care, hence wrongful care denials. So a lot of this has occurred because of a lack of regulation. Uh, we all need regulation, you know, otherwise we fall prey to our bad incentives and uh, departments of insurance in the states are not sufficiently active in enforcing the rules that are out there often. And often the payers, the uh, businesses that are self-insured and buy coverage, the Medicaid agencies are not energetic enforcers of the contracts that they write uh, and, and don't get the full value out of them. 
and one, one dialogue I'd urge you to enter into Arizona is if any of the employers don't like the behavioral health care their employees are getting, they should enforce their own contracts and they should ask for the terms they want in the contracts and, and then go ahead and enforce them. And the same with, the, with your uh, Medicaid agency. Now there have been some steps in the right direction, uh, primarily the Mental Health Parity Addiction Act and uh, the Affordable Care Act that then markedly expanded the scope of parity. So really this kind of is all a long outgrowth of people having a right to care. The original one was the Olmstead decision uh, around people that were kept in state hospitals without active levels of treatment uh, delivered by the departments of mental health running them. And the Olmstead court, in, in the Olmstead case, the court found that you cannot hold people inpatient uh, without more. You can't take things away from them without giving out something else of value. And to some extent, the case I'm going to walk you through expands that from inpatient and voluntary detention to outpatients and saying that outpatients must also be provided with treatment that meets the general standard of care. So it's a little different than saying it has to be at parity with general medical surge care. It's a kind of different field. It's complementary, but it's not the same argument. So you can see this as a trajectory starting with the Wellstone Dominity Dominici Parity Law, which was expanded by the ACA, a ACA, expanded it to more covered populations, but still not all. Remember, straight Medicaid, if you're not in managed care, isn't covered uh, under parity. And a lot of self-insured plans aren't covered under parity. But the Witt case ruling applies to all of them. And you know, a few words about the toolkit that you have a separate web link for. Uh, what it, uh, so the need we wanted to do is to help bridge the gap between how the generally accepted standards are understood and applied by payers and providers to help you make those detailed pointed arguments, making the point that their denial was not consistent with the general standard of care. Uh, this is particularly relevant because of the case of Witt versus United Behavioral Health and also because of parity laws. This is based in a, uh, in a district, in a U.S. district court decision uh, and involved about five, and involved five different states. A uh, little bit about that decision, it has not yet been appealed because the penalties have not been assessed. The decision came out about 18 months ago, but as you know, the gears of the law grind slowly and you cannot appeal a finding until the judge applies a penalty to the uh, party that was found to be wrong. Uh, they, have not, they have not yet applied that penalty and we can anticipate appeals. In any case, it is the law of the land now. It's a standing case. So it's standing case law. The toolkit provides you with compelling arguments for upholding the general accepted standards of care. And we'll go through eight of them and some practical tools for how to implement an appeal strategy. It does not contain legal advice. Can't do that for you. You have to uh, find that on your own. So it's designed for organizations providing treatment for mental illness and substance use disorder, particularly the administrative and clinicians and staff who process the, uh, the denial appeals and the prior authorizations. It's for that subgroup in particular. Uh, it, we, you should use the recommended strategies uh, to help your patients get better access and to help you get paid for what you're probably going to deliver anyway. So who were the plaintiffs? There were 11 plaintiffs that were then expanded into a class action. So this was a class action lawsuit saying that these 11 plaintiffs were representative of a much broader, larger group of people. They asserted that uh, the company uh, failed to uphold its obligation as a fiduciary uh, and was making benefits based on its own financial interests rather than the healthcare needs of the beneficiaries. And they were the based on the position that in all cases, the guidelines they use uh, were more restricted than the generally accepted standards of care. So they asserted that they were systematically being more restrictive uh, than the general accepted way care should be delivered. Uh, the ruling applies to over 50,000 similarly insured individuals in the five states that the class action state included and is generalizable as case, case law beyond that and actually has be, is being applied in regulatory manners in other states such as New York and California currently. More about that later. So here are the, uh, the plaintiff's characteristics. 
about 60% they were appealing a residential treatment denial, 20% were appealing a intensive outpatient denial, and 20% inpatient. So these were the more intensive levels of care. They were about half children and half adults, and a half, about half substance use disorder, and about half uh, for treatment of mental illness. They actually divided them into three different classes uh, for some arcane legal reasons. Uh, one was coverage of residential treatment services for mental illness or substance use disorder. Another was any benefit or plan governed by ERISA, which is the, uh, the, the uh, federal law that covers self-insured plans. And that's notable here because so far parity has not, does not automatically apply to self-insured plans. Uh, and it, in part, this was because these were states that required ASAM criteria to be used. And, and, and they asserted that UBH's criteria they were using was not actually consistent and more restrictive than the ASAM criteria. So what did the judge find after this? Well, the interesting way this proceeded is to determine if you're within the generally accepted standard of care, the court first has to decide what it thinks the generally accepted standard of care is. So it was really a two-stage decisional process the court went through. What is the standard of care? And, the, and are the plaintiffs correct or incorrect in their assertion that the guidelines used by United did not find it? So first they had some opinions about what is the generally accepted standard of care and how do we know what it is? Well, this is interesting for us as practicing physicians because of course it's our duty to practice within the usual standard of care. But you know, it's not really clear, in, at least in my medical school, how I was supposed to figure that out. I mean, in part, some of it is clearly what we're taught in school, in part, some of it is published reviewed articles, in part, some of it's expert consensus opinion. Part of what I liked with our, I mean, my early work with Don and value options is we started running more data and giving the data back to the clinicians about what they, where they fell in the range of practice with their peers, because arguably some of the usual standard of care should be how I'm practicing compared to how you are practicing. Not what we were taught in school, not what it says in research, but what are we all actually doing as a group? So the, uh, the court found there are multiple sources and the court, in the court's opinion, they didn't mention data distribution. The court wasn't there yet, but they did mention peer reviewed studies, consensus guidelines from professional organization and also guidelines and material distributed by government agencies. And they actually identified some specific guidelines in the case of, the, of this class that looked mostly at residential treatment intensive outpatient and inpatient. Uh, the court stipulated that they thought representative of the standard of care were the ASAM criteria, the LOCUS criteria uh, from the American Association of Community Psychiatrists, the CAL LOCUS, the child version of the adult LOCUS, the CASI-2, which is virtually identical, that's another story, but they're 98, 99% identical, the CMS manual, the APA practice guidelines for people with substance use disorder, major depression, and the ACAP guidelines for children and adolescents with mental illness. Uh, so they chose guidelines that were either government produced or produced by professional societies. They didn't identify guidelines like the interqual criteria or the CMG criteria that were produced by for-profit proprietary entities. Uh, overall, they did find that uh, the guidelines used by United at that time, and United has since changed their guidelines. In response to their lawsuit, they have entirely dropped their pre-existing internally developed proprietary guidelines and have adopted the LOCUS, uh, the CAL LOCUS, and the ASAM criteria nationwide across their system. So I know you have United Healthcare as one of your managed Medicaid plans, uh, and so I'll be curious to hear in the discussion if you've noticed much of a change in the last year, 18 months, in your uh, and how the prior authorizations and denials are handled uh, on the United side, but they found there was an overemphasis on moving patients to a less restrictive set setting uh, and creating a system that focused on treating acute symptoms more than facilitating long-term improvement and maintaining existing function and treating the underlying condition. So it was too focused on the immediate acute complaint and not enough on the underlying disorder. 
So they, and they went on to identify really eight principles that they said represented aspects of the generally accepted standard of care. Uh, it's kind of unique for a, a court to get this detail in enunciating uh, standard of care principles. Then we'll go through them one at a time. The first principle was the judge held is that effective treatment requires treatment not of the, uh, requires treatment of the underlying condition and cannot be limited simply to alleviation of current symptoms. You can't just treat chest pain, you have to treat the heart attack. You can't just treat suicidal ideation, you have to treat the depression or psychosis underlying it. Effective treatment requires treatment of co-occurring behavioral health disorders, including substance use disorder or medical conditions in a coordinated manner that considers the interaction of the disorders or their implications for determining level of care. So if the person has another condition that's impacting the effectiveness of your treatment for your primary focus of treatment, uh, that needs to be approved and supported also, that you can't say no, you, you have to just finish treating the suicidal ideation, and then we'll consider whether or not we approve substance use disorder treatment. You can't separate those, they must be considered interactive and as a bundle. Here's a big one. The fact that a lower level of care is less restrictive or intensive does not justify selecting that level if it is also expected to be less effective. There were a number of instances of denial where they said, no, the person is safe enough to be discharged. And the court said, eh, 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 it's not all about safety. If they still could be more treated more effectively at the higher intensive level care, residential instead of intensive, or intensive instead of regular treatment, you have to offer it. Of course, the patient may refuse it. People have a right to refuse if they're not an immediate danger to the other. But that doesn't mean that the payer or us treaters can refuse to offer it. We must offer the most effective treatment currently available. Placement in a less restrictive environment is appropriate only if it's likely to be safe, not only safe, but also just as effective as the higher level care in addressing the person's overall condition, including the underlying and co-occurring disorders. So if their suicidal ideation has resolved, uh, but you know, they are more effectively treated with a longer period of stay for uh, withdrawal symptoms, then you have to continue that. And when there's ambiguity as to the appropriate level of care, the practitioner should err on the side of caution by putting the person at the higher level. So if there's uncertainty, which potentially could be represented by disagreement among the people considering the issue, it should err on the higher side, more intensive level, not on the less intensive. Effective treatment includes services needed to maintain functioning or prevent deterioration. Treatment services can continue if there is a reasonable expectation that if they're withdrawn, the person would deteriorate, relapse further, or require hospitalization. So you have to offer and fund treatment that maintains current level and prevents deterioration. If a person simply is not progressing and getting better, no, noticeably more functional, that alone is not grounds to deny the service. The appropriate duration of treatment is based on individual needs. You can't use specific limits that you apply to everyone. The unique needs of children and adolescents must be taken into account when making level of care decisions involving their treatment. Uh, United was using the same guidelines for adults and kids, and the court found that, that you really need to apply different criteria uh, because there are different treatment needs and different treatment efficacies and approaches for those populations. And then determination of the appropriate level of care should be made on the basis of a multi-dimensional assessment that takes into account a wide variety of information about the patient. So the interqual criteria, the CMG criteria, many of the proprietary insurance criteria really only look at symptom severity and risk. The locus criteria, the ASAM criteria, also look at previous response to treatment or resilience, patient engagement, uh, social determinants like the supportiveness or stressfulness of the discharge environment and comorbidity. So this really requires, and this will help the companies, they all are saying they want to look more at social determinants and this requirement to look at a multi-dimensional assessment includes some of those aspects like supportiveness or stressfulness of the treatment environment, engagement of the family, engagement of the patient, 
uh, it will help them move in the direction they say they would like to. They, they are not consistent internally. Not everybody wants to do the same thing within a managed care company. So overall, the court found that uh, the company was not consistent with, the with those eight general accepted principles. The court found that this was the standard of care and said, well, your criteria are not consistent and you're uh, emphasizing too much on acute symptoms and crisis. Uh, and the fact that a lower level of care is less restrictive doesn't mean you can assist the person be discharged simply because they're safe to be discharged to the lower level. They also have to be as effectively treated at the lower level of care. Uh, you, they didn't have separate criteria for children um, and they weren't using a multi-dimensional approach. Now to UBH's credit, shortly after this decision, very rapidly, they dropped their internal criteria they adopted the ASAM criteria, the locus and the cal locus, uh, and have, and from my point of view, are, are making vigorous efforts to comply uh, with these new principles of care. It takes a while to change a big organization, but I think they're really trying hard. They did find they had breached their duty and were liable, that they had violated the state laws where they were required to use the ASAM criteria and that they were more restrictive and that they had overly weighted on their financial interests. So what are the implications? Well, first, the framework by the court is widely applicable. Uh, they chose ERISA because it, governor, it, it governs and defines the fiduciary duty of insurance companies for all the employer-funded self-insured plans. That's a huge swath of insurance. Any insurance coverage where there's a requirement either in statute, regulation, or contract terms, the coverage be consistent with the general community standard of care. ERISA says that in federal law. But things like Medicaid managed care plans that are not covered by ERISA, I've never seen a, a single Medicaid managed care contract that didn't say they had to provide care consistent with the general community standard of care in their contract. Proprietary guidelines used to make coverage decision regarding uh, behavioral health decisions by other insurance companies are, uh, to my observation, usually in the same position as uh, United's were. They overweight crisis, uh, they underweight effectiveness of treatment, and they, uh, they are not multidimensional. Uh, there are potential state law violations in states that require the use. There are some states that require locus either in contract or in uh, statute, and there's an increasing number of states requiring ASAM. Uh, there's an overemphasis on acute treatment uh, and de-emphasis on long comprehensive care, uh, and an overemphasis on safety and a de-emphasis on maximum effective. You know, since this came, since this decision came out. The state of New York has passed regulation that all of any insurance in New York must be consistent with, must have a multi-dimensional assessment in several of these principles. Some of the same language was just signed into in law in California, requiring all insurance in California to meet similar criteria. So this is rapidly becoming the standard operation expectation. Uh, it's actually taking off more faster than I thought it would have. But it exists as case law everywhere, even though we're not you in Arizona or not in California or in New York, it is still a very useful argument. And of course, in the end, the standard of care is what we as organized professional groups say it is. And we should assert that. And we should say it loudly and clearly, uh, really, to back up the court. I think they got right what we think is the standard of care. And we should make a point of publicly agreeing with them if we do agree. Uh, because, uh, you know, judges should have the backing of clinicians when they're making an, a clinical pronouncement about standard of care. Oh, go on. So, your, what you should do from your agency state is take a look at our toolkit and examine your agency's claims denial data and identify what reasons for denial are at odds for one of these eight or more standards of care. I would urge you to take a targeted, systematic, data-driven approach. Don't go one by one. Categorize the reasons for denial of care and choose the ones that are pointedly inconsistent with one or more of these eight principles and go after a focused thing one at a time. If you try to do everything at once, you won't be as successful as if you focus on one or two key issues at a time and why not choose your high volume problems? 
it's important that you understand each of your insurers utilization review criteria if you're part of the staff that's uh, whose job it is to uh, get prior authorizations and appeal denials. And I would really urge you to get yourself trained on the ASAM criteria, the locus and the cow locus. If you're going to appeal a finding on the basis of these criteria, you should be able to show that you were trained in those criteria and not just shooting from the hip. Increasingly, the insurance staff will be trained. They'll have a little certificate saying, I'm ASAM trained, I'm locus trained, and you will not be as credible. We will not be as credible unless we also obtain that training when we're involved in the prior authorization and appeal of denials. The rest of the staff should be educated on the language, on the key principles, and, and, and how to uh, incorporate them into the appeal process. You should look uh, at the language you currently use for your appeals of denials and your prior authorizations and update your standardized letters. You'll find the toolkit has some standardized language that you can cut and paste and adapt and rewrite as fits your organization or as fits this individual case. Uh, but you should have standardized language and we would urge you to directly reference this case and these eight principles. Why? You know, you, United Behavioral Health is facing the possibility that they will have to pay claims that they denied going back years in five states. If you identify specific findings against these principles, you're building a body of cases where the next insurance company could be worried, oh my God, you know, it's on record that I wasn't with the principal according to these docs of this one case. If this ever rolls around here, this will be make it more likely I have to pay back that claim. It makes the argument a little more weighty. Uh, be prepared with talking points when you're on the phone to cite language from the WIT case ruling when you speak to the utilization reviewers uh, and to ask for a peer review rather than a chart review. I would really urge you to insist as much as you can that you get a peer review uh, and not just a paper chart review. You can't do this with every case. That's why you need to choose a small number of cases that represent a high volume of reasons that you're getting denials and tip those individual reasons and high volume buckets one at a time because you don't have the time to do peer review on all of them, but you should choose something to go after. You wanna make a case that for residential treatment uh, is important uh, for substance use disorders and mental illness for some people. A lot of people do better at lower levels of care, but some people need, uh, need, need those more intensive levels. Uh, maintain your documentation and be persistent. Persistence is important. So you'll see, I wanna go over a few of the appeal letters we're offering you. Uh, element number one uh, would be to explain that their determination violates the ex generally accepted standards of care. This is wonderful legal red flag language. You know, the court finds by the preponderance of evidence uh, that there's a duty, uh, guidelines that are unreasonable and do not reflect these standards of care. Uh, our violation of the standards. Talk about, talk, talk about this court case and they're doing something similar to what the court found was a violation of the community standard of care. Reference the guidelines that were pointed out by the court. Reference the locus, reference the ASAM criteria, reference the APA guidelines, reference the ACAP guidelines in support of medical necessity. Make the assertion that medical necessity is defined by professional guidelines and here's what whatever guideline you want to quote says. State that the decision is non-compliant with parity, with Wellstone Dominici parity when it is and where applicable and draw a connection between overly restrictive guidelines and the violation of the parity law. Language like the record is replete with evidence that the guidelines are viewed as an important tool for utilization management. You know, if you're using this to manage our utilization, you're trying to get around the Parity Act and you shouldn't be doing that. State the specific standards of care as written in the court's proceedings. We've given you the language of each of those principles. You can say, you know, the most troubling aspect in, uh, of your denial, uh, Magellan, is that you just said they weren't suicidal anymore. You've overemphasized crisis. 
and you underweighted their ongoing treatment stability. And if there's disagreement, say this is evidence of ambiguity. And the courts held when there's ambiguity, you should err on the higher level of care. That evidence of ambiguity is a very powerful argument when there's disagreement. So here's an appeal sample paragraph based on the generally acceptance of care. I believe that your denial of Ms. Gale's residential service violates six of the eight generally accepted standards of care. I trust you're committed to upholding your legal responsibility as your patient's fiduciary. These are all magic legal buzzwords that make lawyers anxious and respectfully re suggest that you reconsider your decision by applying standards that are consistent with generally accepted standards of care, such as the locus fiduciary duty, legal responsibility. This is different than just she really needs it and I'm her doctor. Here's some sample language on explaining the standardized violation. The court stipulated that effective treatment requires co-occurring disorders, underlying conditions treated in a coordinated manner. What if somebody you're treating somebody for their substance use disorder and they're not yet undepressed or they're still too anxious enough? In this case, the reviewer violated two standards by narrow, focusing too narrowly on the current symptomology, acute needs, and failed to consider uh, her other complex conditions, including depression, anxious distress, and unspecified personality disorder. You haven't weighted her personality disorder enough. Finally, at best, our disagreement about the appropriate level of care could be representative of ambiguity about the appropriate level of care, in which case the court has found that the generally accepted standard is to err on the side of safety and authorize the higher level of care. We also offer you some phone scripts that you can use in having a telephone discussion. I believe denial of Joe Parks's uh, continue intensive treatment would violate a number of the eight generally accepted standards of care. Following these, stand, following these standards is seen as best medical practice. A failure to do so puts your company at risk for violating the parity law. One of the affirmed standards is that effective treatment must be based on a multidimensional assessment. It's, take, if you're not familiar with the LOCUS and ASAM, you should familiarize themselves because they assert that, it's, that people need attention to many things you want to attend to. Patient engagement, family engagement, prior response to treatment, comorbidities, stressfulness of the discharge environment, supportiveness of the discharge environment. This puts them on the table as legitimate factors in deciding uh, how intense a treatment level somebody should get and how long they should persist in it. I wanna give credit to my collaborator, Eric Playkoon, who's medical director and CEO at Austin Rig Center. We, a lot of the letters that you have in the toolkit were drafted by him and his staff. Uh, Dr. Playkoon was one of the expert uh, witnesses that testified regarding the standard of care in the WIT, in the WIT case. Uh, he really deserves uh, our recognition and thanks uh, for the service that he's done for the field and his work on this case and on uh, systemizing these appeals. He was the plaintiff's attorney for WIT, uh, and he was the expert in assessing outpatient, intensive outpatient and residential. Uh, spent several decades at Roston Riggs as director of admissions and treatment team leader, making level of care decisions and overseeing appeals. Uh, 40 years in practice, uh, broad knowledge, very active in the APA, GAP and other societies. So he would make the point that he kept an open mind when he agreed to review these criteria. He, he would be telling you, after all, managed care operates with the same moral import, imperative as the environmental movement. We're in a world of managed resources, whether this is greenhouse gas or the cost in health insurance. There's only so much to meet everybody's need. And I would argue that all of us do utilization management in our own caseload. We all decide how much time we're going to spend with who. You can't see more than one patient at a time in your caseload without doing some kind of utilization management. So I really don't agree with the stance of some of our colleagues that say, you know, it's all about this, we shouldn't have to put up with that. That frankly is unrealistic. You know, we have to triage resources and we have to recognize the problem, but we still must be within the generally accepted standard of care 
And we must all learn that because it's not what each of us makes up individually in our heads. Uh, so he proceeded by evaluating the access to care criteria that requires understanding the goals of treatment. Many patients struggle with chronic recurrent disorders, comorbid disorders, trauma, a lot of ACEs out there. Evidence-based treatments work, but tested on single unicorn patients. You know, most of the evidence we have are not on the messy patients we see who have multiple disorders going on simultaneously. And there are higher uh, failure rates when there are comorbidities and trauma to the evidence-based treatments. Given this reality, the generally accepted goal of the treatment is improvement in functional status to get people to recovery. Uh, the SAMHSA definition of recovery from mental illness and substance use disorder is generally aligned with the generally accepted standard. It's a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their potential. This is again consistent with effective treatment for the whole condition as opposed to focus on only safety and acute symptoms. The usual road to recovery in treatment requires two skills of our patients. They have to have the capacity to use the sessions, the treatment sessions with us, and then they have to have enough functional capacity to keep in the community and safe and reasonable between sessions. So they have to be able to use the treatment offered and they hold themselves together and stay within expected social norms between when, they, when we leave them and when they see us next. If one or both of these are impaired, we bump people to a higher level of service. As long as my patient can see me an outpatient, have some med visits, some therapy, and come back in a week, a month, whatever, and still continue to get better, at least not get worse, that's okay. But if they have more symptoms, then I need to do a higher level of care, intensive outpatient, residential, or inpatient. We do that by adding services sometimes medications, sometimes more therapy, more frequent sessions, skills training, group or family therapy, treatment for comorbid disorders, and eventually this adds up into intensive outpatient or partial hospitalization. And now we're in more a 24-hour immersion to go to higher levels if they cannot be maintained in intensive outpatient. In patient setting, if there's uh, acute risk. So residential treatment has to grapple with the underlying issues and in interfering with the outpatient functioning. If the residential treatment or inpatient treatment doesn't address what it was that made them require the high, higher level, uh, like their history of trauma, like their comorbidity, and trauma can take months to work on even, uh, even at the beginning. But in the end, the goal is still improve functional status to achieve recovery. So overall, Dr. Playkun said what he found was that most of the commercial criteria uh, are differ from the generally accepted standards of care. The pot's boiling over, uh, but they don't turn down the fire. They wipe up the boil over and you don't turn down the fire underneath. They focus on crisis and stabilization, not recovery. They limit access to care to the current problem and then reduce or end the additional services like, oh, there's no more coming out of the pot. I can stop wiping it now. Well, you haven't turned down the flame yet. Limiting intermediates, of, intermediates levels of care to only crisis stabilization doesn't turn down the flame. It just wipes up the mess. So, Dr. Playku would argue, Playkun would argue that intensive outpatient and residential treatment are kind of the canaries in the coal mine, letting us know that the criteria, the usual standard of care is not being adequately applied. Uh, it's kind of the wild west out there because of the lack of regulation uh, in the departments of insurance and by the people that purchase insurance, whether they're employers, Medicaid agencies uh, are the major ones. But it is changing. More regulation is occurring. I want to share with you the Austin Riggs systematic appeal strategy. So they have an appeals process. They 
bring the patient into it and educate them that they are a party to a binding legal contract with their insurance. Uh, they actually discuss with whether or not the patient would want to get an attorney. Now, if you're with Medicaid, that means asking legal aid, low likelihood of getting it. Uh, so it depends on who you're working with. They anchor their appeals uh, to the locus and practice guidelines. They invoke the parity law and quote it often. They use pre-written templates. They get together in committees and say, okay, what's the best, how do we best make our argument? And, and let's all try and work off that. We'll, we'll adapt it, of course, for individual cases and companies, but let's use our collective wisdom rather than do this one at a time alone. And after the wit verdict, they started citing elements of the verdict. Now this is not, a, this does improve collections, but it also makes sure that patients get the care they need. And it also over time will change the insurance company's behavior. If they lose these arguments often enough, or if they get the same argument repeatedly, which makes their risk management lawyers more anxious that they're getting multiple letters, dozens of letters every month asserting that they're not meeting the legal standard of care from multiple organizations and psychiatrists, that makes risk management attorneys nervous. And their job is to make the rest of the leadership nervous and they do that very well. So you can change behavior, you just have to be systematic and persistent. The same as changing behavior around substance use disorder, right? Systematic, persistent, long-term enterprise. Uh, again, urge you to get training if you don't have it in the locus. Uh, widely used, it's in use in 26 states, several other countries, often cited as a source for insurance utilization review standards for access to care. Uh, uh, three components that look beyond crisis stabilization to recovery. It has six dimensions, not just safety, also functional capacity, comorbidity, response to treatment, strengths for assessing level of care, it has six levels of care, outpatient through hospitalization, and it describes what those various levels are. And it offers a quantitative methodology to rate the levels of care or to override scores. So they have their therapists uh, do doctor to doctor reviews and write appeals letters, tips from their experience. Uh, when seeking patient treatment beyond outpatient, speak about the patient's problems or overall need for treatment. Also make the case for the specific level of care. You know, this is where they score on the ASAM. This is where they score on the locus. In the appeals, focus, focus the letter or conversation on the reasons for denial, not just that you think they should get this level of care, but you stated this reason and you are incorrect because of ABC. Uh, nothing helps more than uh, citing locus and wit and ASAM. I understand you and I disagree about the need for X level of care, but the patient's locus score aligns with my view. And it's a kind of multidimensional independent third party assessment used in most states, other countries, and Judge Spiro cited as essential in the wit verdict. That will usually get you from the first level peer review up to his boss. You know, he said, oh, geez, this doc is like citing court cases to me. And he appears to know the details. Document the whole time. So if you call up and you're on hold, write it down, document flawed numbers, document all the conflicting explanations they give and keep reciting them back to them. Well, I talked to so-and-so. Now they did make me hold 20 minutes and they dropped me three times, but then they gave me a different explanation than you just gave me. What did you say your name was? I'm taking notes. Uh, here's how uh, Riggs got uh, their experience with getting coverage uh, for residential treatment. They were going from uh, 39 days up to 66 days approved, median days from 24 up to 38 days approved. This does make a difference if you do it systematically. And I want you to notice they track it. This is a performance indicator for them. And they change their methods based on the performance they get. They're applying to insurance company behavior the same principles of data-driven care uh, that we aspire to apply to our clinical work also. So there's the micro level, the appeals and reviews you do, which is why I give this talk, uh, will help at the macro level. It will tame this unruly behavior over time. Uh, Riggs used the National Council Toolkit. They made it available to their utilization review staff and clinicians. If you're not that group, 
give it to them, bring it back from this meeting and give it to the people doing that work at your agency. There's never been a better time to lean on this. As I said, it's a fresh case, only been out about 12, 18 months, uh, still being debated legally. New York's already on board, California's on board, and you know when those big dogs get on board, things start to change. This is a way we can reclaim our authority over who gets to say what the accepted standard of care is. It's good for our patients. Uh, and, you know, we should really thank Judge Spiro, too, you know, to help us bring this to a better place than we've been recently. Yeah, there's a vision of you walking, uh, walking back into the office on Monday. There's a new sheriff in town. So as I said, it's gaining momentum. Uh, Optimum United has adopted the Locus and the ASAM and is complying nationally or doing their best to change their system. It's hard to change big systems fast. New York State now requires review of all commercial insurance coverage and approval that it complies with the multi-dimensional level of care and other WIT standards. California has just signed into law, Governor Newsom just this last month, I think two weeks ago maybe, uh, signed into law, putting the WIT standards into statute. And there are some more suits of this nature about to be filed uh, with some of the other major guidelines uh, coming to a courtroom near you soon. So there's where you can download uh, the toolkit. Uh, if you have questions, you can contact me or uh, our project manager, uh, Lindsay DiSorrento. Uh, at this point, uh, I'd love to hear your experience with appeals denials. I'd love to hear uh, your impressions as whether it's getting better or worse. Um, I'd love to hear what you think the feasibility is. I'm up for questions, I'm up for disagreements or pointing out my egregious errors, which as Don will tell you are frequent in many. So I, I could use that support and feedback. Much, that was uh, excellent. Really good information, very timely, especially in this state. There's, there's an environment that I think is really receptive to this. And I think uh, all we gotta do is, is make it happen is, is to execute and so um, you know, we find some of the same issues here. Um, I, I, you know, um, our parity law, you know, we, we were successful in getting things to place in February, but there's still a lot more work to do. And I guess one of the, well, one of the questions I would have, you know, um, or a, a, really a comment and question is, um, you know, how you, how do you think this will impact things like the intermediate levels of care like residential and IOP and partial and particularly in the substance use world where there's been a, uh, it's changing a little bit, but there's still, you know, this idea that you can get detoxed and then sent out with a sponsor, a 12 step program and, and make it out there. And some can, but most can't. Mm -hmm. And this whole idea of needing a little longer, especially the other thing that, um, you know, when you couple it with a comorbid, mental health problem like depression or something mm -hmm. um it's just hard to get well in three or four days or even a week or two so be interested to hear your perspectives on that you know uh especially on the substance use disorder side the asam level of care are even further along as being a nationally accepted standard than the locus and cal locus are and uh, anytime you're appealing a denial of substance use services i would quote the asam criteria and assert that it is the national standard of care and that they have a fiduciary duty to provide coverage consistent with the standard of care and then enunciate back to these these other principles the other eight principles uh, the uh, but the asam is actually running uh, a little ahead of locus cal locus uh, in terms of being a generally accepted standard it's uh, mandated in uh, probably a I think we're up to about 15 states that require by law all insurance to be consistent with the ASAM. I can't keep track as more do it all the time. I, I think a related um, question has, it's a little different but related and that's network sufficiency. So if you're a health plan um, and um, you know someone gets admitted to the hospital and let's say they're, you know, they have a comorbid mental health substance use problem and uh, they're suicidal 
they get admitted, they're, they're stabilized and uh, no longer acutely suicidal, but the decision is made to, to um, transition them to say a residential level of care. Well, here in Arizona, I had this experience recently this, you know, this actually happened to someone where they um, went through this and the only substance use residential treatment available in this health plans network was a 14 bed unit in Bisbee, which is in the far southeastern part of the state for women only. And um, I was amazed in a state this size that we had that this plan had only one place where someone could go. And I don't know if you guys, if that's ever, you know, if any of this has ever leaked over into those considerations or. You know, we, we had that problem in Missouri uh, when I was uh, with the Department of Health and Medicaid, we ended up requiring use of the LOCUS uh, and the ASAM criteria. And it was mostly followed on the inpatient decision. But after we made that requirement, we found that people that scored as needing residential or intensive outpatient were often being discharged to uh, lower levels of care, to, you know, outpatient visits once a week or something like that. Uh, so we, we ended up actually changing the contract to say that you have to continue to authorize the highest level of care you have available consistent with their score. So if you choose not to have residential treatment in your contracts, so you say, oh, there is none. Well, fine, you can keep paying inpatient then if you choose not to have intensive outpatient. Now, if you're, you won't, you're not in the situation of being the person to write the contract terms, but you can make the assertion. You can say it's not consistent with the standard of care to give somebody lower than the level that they need to be effective and safe. So cool. Locus, uh, you know, ASAM says that they need residential, but you don't have it. Leave them inpatient until they can do get by with intensive outpatient or until you go out and contract with more residential. It will incentivize building the panel, making the argument in that way in, in the long run incentivizes uh, having a more complete continuum of care. And I think as a society, when you're talking to your legislatures, you should say, you know, we need a regulation here that they can't, that they have to authorize care that's actually available. They can't make me discharge somebody to residential and not have residential available. That just isn't right. Those are good talking points with your legislator, with your Medicaid agency. Uh, those are excellent examples to take to them, but they're also ec excellent examples to make in those appeal letters. Yeah. I, just keep I, on saying they're outside the standard of care. That That is a legal red flag. Uh, of increasing concern because the other companies certainly are aware of what happened. I've, I've had several of them approach me with anxious conversations about what we're thinking about WIT because they're trying to figure out what to do. A number of the other large companies are, are, are kind of like anxious and they should be. That's good. We only change when we're anxious, right? <laughs> you know, the last thing I'll say, I want to, want, want to give everyone else an opportunity here, but I think at, um, we can take this offline. But um, I think it would be worth having a meeting with, with our Medicaid agency here, the medical directors of psychiatrists, and share similar perspectives on managed care that you do. Her name's Sara Salak. You may already know her. Um, but uh, I think it, there'd be a really willing and, and accepting audience. And I think it'd help change some policy. We also have a governor and some legislators who are pretty um, sensitive to these issues and, and want to improve things. And so I think the timing for this couldn't be better. And maybe I can get with you offline afterwards. I'd be happy to do that. And I'm sure that uh, our state, your state community mental health center association would be happy to participate. Yeah, uh, we can get our state affairs person involved if we want to have a little group get together and talk to you. And that's like your local call as to whether we're better off with personal conversations or a group approach. Uh, but we're, uh, I'm pleased to help you, Don, and the National Council stands behind uh, the treatment providers in Arizona. Very good. Um, I have a question, and, and apologies, Dr. Parks, if, if you covered this in some way. Um, can you comment on any relationship between the WIT lawsuit and the New York State Psych Society suit against UBH a few years ago? 
Uh, re remind me of, of the key point on the New York Psych Society. I think it was around payment differentials, wasn't it? Different, different payment rates that they were being systematically underpaid. I believe that's right. Yeah, uh, I think it is, it is not directly parallel. It goes also to adequacy, though, if you don't offer adequate rates, especially in a pay place like New York, where over half of us are in cash-only practice, you're not going to have you're not going to have an adequate network. I think that was more a network adequacy argument uh, than an authorizing care within the standards of care argument. Uh, so I, I think that was somewhat different. It's just as important, uh, you know. The the interesting thing, if you if you offer too low a rate, you won't have an adequate network and people will have to go out of network more often, which then becomes a parity violation because when you go out of network, you have to pay the extra deductible and the extra copay, right? Anytime we go out of network, we have to pay the second level of deductible and there's a higher copay. And under parity, you're not supposed to have more restrictive general procedures, but here you made it more likely by having an inadequate network uh, that you'll need to pay a higher copay and deductible. So it kind of is a way to use a non-quantitative limitation to turn it into a quantitative limitation through the back door. I think it's a good argument. It's a different argument and a different uh, point of misbehavior than was focused on at WIT. As, as our psychiatric physicians look at, you know, trying to make these appeals more effective, we're, they're caught in that cycle of um, when it, it seems like a barrier to providing care within networks. So like, how do we get more psychiatric physicians to participate in the networks when they're having to work hard like this? So, like, is it kind of a seesaw that has to catch up one side to the other? Uh, I think that that is one of the, one of the yeah, it's a feedback loop and one makes the other makes the other worse. I think the, you know, the two things that make people decide not to be in network are rates substantially below what they can, if they can keep their schedule full and cash only. And second, the extra administrative time, the fear of denials, you know, I, I'm gonna, I, I get paid not enough for the time I spend and then I have to spend more time and then you might wanna scrape it back. Um, those are parity issues, you know, more aggressive audits and also uh, inappropriately great rate differentials against market. Uh, we tried to make it easy because we know you're real busy by giving you some draft scripts and some pre-written appeals letters because we know you don't have time to, you know, to craft all this stuff yourself. Uh, but we're hoping you'd find the time to, uh, you know, take a look and do a little cut and paste and what really begs the question too, how we as a society can help out in this process. I think it, it would, if you decided as a group, what was the most, two or three most common reasons for denial, whether it was uh, they're not suicidal anymore or whether it's uh, I'm, you're, you're supposed to be treating the depression and I don't care if they have these other substance abuse problems. Look at the principles and decide what your one or two highest volume is and agree we're all going to go after the same one. If they get repeatedly hammered from multiple places by the, on the same point, they're more likely to change. The other thing is I'd compare notes on which companies you think are more consistent and less consistent. Not all companies act the same. Uh, I would focus on... I would focus on the one or two highest volume issues and the one or two highest volume companies and see how you can do on tipping that and then move down to the next in line. And Dr. Park says you see more states adopt parity laws and we see more data collected, a little bit more uh, scrutiny to how coverages are, are being made available to insureds. What are some things that we as advocates might ask for, ask our departments of insurance to be especially scrutiny, scrutinizing about data points? Or like, what are some really key things that, that show up often and, and, and are, are good to develop an awareness of with our departments of insurance? You know, um, parity is very complicated and a lot of the departments of insurance don't have the internal expertise to look at it. 
One great new opportunity that has come about is URAC, which is an accreditation agency involved in accrediting utilization review operations, has a new uh, parity accreditation product. And now, so far, no plans have applied to be accredited as that parity, but they have had a lot of plans and some departments of insurance by their tool that allows them to assess how close to parity they are. It's a parity assessment tool. So uh, you, you might take a look at URAC under parity accreditation, parity assessment, and start talking to your department of insurance about, you know, are, are you doing something systematic like this? I mean, they, they have like a 30 or 40 page long involved process uh, that a company can use to self-assess itself. And then there's another level where they send the data to URAC and URAC gives an opinion by accreditation. Yes, you need it or you don't, or here's where the gaps are. So there's two levels. I mean, you could insist on the self-assessment and then turn it into the state agency. That way your state agency would get standardized review from all the plans. And it would certainly would get their attention if they had to do that. It wouldn't cost the state agency anything though it would be another legislative burden on a private business. And of course, that's a hot political issue. That's interesting. One of the things that's going on here is we're, you know, we, we've had a law passed, Jake's law in February, and now the rules mm -hmm. making begins, the fun begins, right? Yeah, yeah. So we've actually been working with the uh, APA DC office, Clemens and, and a couple people there, who've been, who are, he's really expert on the parity law nationally and its application in various states. And he's helped us get that law passed. He's, he's, he's very involved with us. And one of the things that we're working with the Department of Insurance on here is, you know, what sort of tool do they use to measure health plan performance with in terms of their compliance with the law? So the law, there's a tool that came out of Pennsylvania that, that he likes a lot. But we should probably take a look at this URAC thing too. It's, it's I, I'm happy to make the introduction, Don, to the uh, the people running that at URAC, if you'd yeah, like. Yeah, I'd appreciate that actually. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Let me make a note. Yeah, it's uh, it's the nicest product I've seen that looks at systemically across all those very complicated issues. And I think while while Joe's doing that, um, I think one of the things here, Terry and everyone, is I, you know, this, I think this is a great opportunity to actually have an impact on on, you know, the stuff that we don't like in managed care, and um, I think that and, and a barrier has been you, you know everyone's pretty busy, you guys are busy seeing patients, and all that, and I think so. One of the things we got to figure out is how we can use this society as, as an organizing force or, or resource to help help with that process because I'm just you know I think if we can if we can do follow up on what Joe's saying here and, and get this organized and make it a little more focused and then it's going to be less time for you guys in documenting this type of stuff you can you know we can get some help there but also you know targeting it where we need to I, I think just the, the the point here is a little organizational help here at the uh, society level, I think would go a long way. Yep, little organization. If you're lean on something, if you all lean together, you'll get further than one at a time. Exactly. Now, I had one other uh, issue I wanted to bring to your all's attention, uh, and that is upcoming changes on January 1st to the E&M coding requirements for, you know, the 99212, 212, 213, uh, that they're going under substantial changes. Has that been on the society's radar? Um, our APA practice management has been uh, pushing out updates on coding impacts to psychiatry and uh, asked everyone that had some comments to contribute to the physician's uh, fee schedule coming up. Uh, the deadline, I guess, is on Monday. We pushed that out to our members with some draft positions and comments as reference to develop their own from? Well, the part that's a done deal that's happening January 1st is for Medicare at least, uh, coding will no longer be dependent on the complexity of the exam and the history. Coding will be dependent on the complexity of medical decision making or the total time spent to the benefit of the patient. So 
The old rule is you can code based on time in e &M codes if you spend more than half the time counseling the patient on something, and that's a face-to-face -face time. The new code it is total time to the benefit of the patient. So that includes talking to other doctors, talking to the treatment team, calling the pharmacy. Now the problem here is the dual eligibles. Medicare is gonna change. They always change automatically with CPT coding. What's unclear is how quick Medicaid agencies or their Medicaid managed care plans will change. So you could be in an environment for a while where you have to code for both simultaneously, but at least you need to know. I think you should approach your Medicaid agency and say, are you gonna, are you gonna expect us all to document and to code uh, consistent with what CPT says, or are you still gonna use the old rules for a while? This is especially important because a lot of visits that are 99212 and 99213 coded by history and exam will be 99214 is coded by decision making. Remember, you can't go to a level four unless you involve a second organ system on the exam. But if we ignore that and do decision making alone, you make a level four for anybody that has two chronic disorders and you're managing their medication. How many patients you got that ain't got two chronic disorders and you're managing? It's all going to upcode. But if you upcode consistent with the new CPT and put in that billing and the commercial, the MCO or Medicaid, you could be accused of inappropriately fraudulently billing unless they're clear whether they're using the current CPT after January 1st or the new CPT. I but think Dr. that's Prince, the important issue for discussion. That's a great point. Dr. Prenzlauer asks, will the January 2021 include documentation time also? Total time spent to the benefit of the patient. That includes documentation, that includes calling pharmacies. Think of your opportunities for care coordination. Uh, you can you include the time you're talking with other professionals for, uh, you know, for, for uh, integrated care. You include the time talking to primary care if you take time to make a phone call. It's great, it's really good change. And a very enthusiastic finally from Dr. Prenzlar. That, that's great. Well, this is another reason to meet with Dr. Salak at Medicaid. It really is. They will struggle to change their computer systems fast enough to do this. You know that down from the inside, even if they want to do the right thing. Right. I mean, between now and January 1st, is crazy quick to change the programming on the adjudication machinery. So I think the best thing you could do is say, you know, we just want an abeyance of audits until you get it all straightened out. You know, because do you really want to have to put for your dual eligibles, put down the face-to-face -face time and the time to the benefit at the same note? You want two different times on the same note? It gets crazy real quick. That's a good idea, though, abeyance of audits and, and other things like that. that. That's a really good idea. A statement of intent, what do you want us to do? And then let's, let's just give us all six, 12 months to get it straight. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Parks. We're, we're all wrapped up on the, on the participant attendee questions right now. Very good. Well, I, um, Joe, I want to thank you for taking the time. Um, and really, this was extremely informative and timely mm -hmm. and uh, gives us a lot to think about and, and you know, figure out how we're going to do some of this because I think it's, it, it's very um, important in our work right now. Yeah. And I know many of you don't do the dials and appeals yourself, but give it to the staff that do. I, I want to thank you all for, for the recognition award. I, I am deeply touched and thank you so much. I'll tell you, Joe, if anyone deserved it, it's you. I got to tell you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. You take good care. Bye-bye. All right. So I guess we're... We'll uh, return at 4 p.m. for our legislative update, everybody. This is a, a short break. This is a short break, everyone. We'll return at uh, 4 p.m. for our last session of the day. Uh, 
our exhibitors uh, may still be available to you. If they've left, they should leave a posting of what their challenge word is. We thank you and hope you're enjoying a great day with us.